Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about Earth systems. Topic for the day is going to be land use and classification. Might be a long one today, so let me just go ahead and jump in and get you some objectives. By the end of this video, be able to discuss the tragedy of commons, externalities, and maximum sustainable yield. Be able to describe each of the major types of land use. And finally, understand the division of American land management. So let's go ahead and jump on in. That's what we've got for the day. So first thing, land use, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've been talking about earth systems. We've talked about mineral, mineral resources. We've talked about mining. Now we're just going to talk about the general use of land. Now, when it comes to using land around the world, there is the good that would be managing land for conservation, habitat protection, species protection, beautiful views, recreation, things like that. But there's also bad land use management, and that would be obviously overuse for mining, destruction, things like that. And there's always a lot of debate about how a tract of land should be used, you know. Should it be preserved? Should it be conserved? Or should it be allowed to be used for its resources? So as we talk about land use throughout the rest of this video, just recognize that there is always an inherent conflict between how a piece of land should be used and how it actually is used. Now, before we actually get into land use, there's a couple of basic principles that you need to be aware of before we actually start talking about ways that people use the land. The first one is the tragedy of commons. Now, the tragedy of commons is an idea that I have mentioned previously, but I want to circle back to and kind of just make sure that it's good and clear in your head. Here's a model that describes the tragedy of commons. Basically, it's the idea that if you have got common resource, this would be a resource that is open to everybody. Anybody can use it. Anybody can use as much of it as they want. If you have a situation like that, the idea is that everybody will be a little bit greedy and they will use as much of that resource as they can to benefit themselves. Problem is, if you have everybody using that resource as much as they can, eventually the resource is going to become depleted. So the classic uh, example of this would be sheep grazing land. You've got a common area of land. Farmers can put as many sheep on there to graze as they want. So each farmer thinks, all right, well, this is free land. I can graze as much as I want, and they put on as many sheep as they want. So each farmer keeps putting on a ton of sheep, and because there's so many sheep, the sheep overgraze the land, and eventually the resource is completely depleted, which means that nobody can use it now. So this is the idea of tragedy commons, is that when there's a common resource, people tend to misuse and overuse it. The next idea that you need to be aware of, and this is another one we've mentioned before, but that is externalities. And technically defined, an externality is a cost or benefit not included in the purchase price. So this would be the idea that manufacturing your clothes might produce pollution or environmental damage in another part of the world. You're not paying for that pollution or the environmental damage. It's happening somewhere else. You're buying your shirt. You don't have to deal with it. So externalities is just kind of linking the idea that, hey, Sometimes producing things or manufacturing things damages the environment, but that environmental damage is not included in the purchase price of that thing. And it would be interesting to see if that damage was included in the purchase price, how much that would change consumer behavior. Final concept that you need to be aware of is maximum sustainable yield. And the idea behind maximum sustainable yield is it's the maximum harvest without compromising future availability. So this is the idea of how much can you take from the environment while still allowing the environment to keep supplying enough to have um, sufficient resources going forward. Now, it's hard to say what is maximum sustainable yield for a resource in an area because obviously you have to know reproduction rates and population size and how quickly things are growing. You need to know weather. You, know, you need to know season. There's a lot of stuff you need to know. But as a general rule, uh, maximum sustainable yield is thought to be somewhere around one half of the carrying capacity of the environment. If you remember this graph from when we were talking about population growth models, this is a logarithmic graph. So you have slow growth, then you go exponential, and then eventually your population bumps up against carrying capacity where it won't get any bigger because the environment can't support it. So the thought is that if you stay right here at one half, you are in the steepest part of the growth phase for this population. You are not allowing them to bump up against carrying capacity, but you are allowing there to be enough individuals to continue reproducing. So one half carrying capacity is generally thought to be maximum sustainable yield. Now for the rest of this video, we're going to go ahead and talk about lands and land use and management of land. But first I want to show you this map to kind of illustrate around the world lands that are protected. So roughly globally, 11% of the world's surface is protected. And some of that is protected ocean 
you know, oceanscapes. Uh, part of that is land. You've got jungles. You've got prairies. You've got deserts. You've got Arctic regions. You've got coral reefs. So around the world, a lot of the land is protected. And if you look at the map, you can see that in Europe, land protection is huge. America, not so much of our land is protected. Africa, that big open spot across the top, that would be the Sahara. Not much to protect there, just uh, sand. A big blue spot in South America, that would be the Amazon. So depending on where you are in the world, your government might have a different view about protecting land. But here's kind of like the big scale, 30,000 foot view of what land around the world is protected. Now I'm going to go through six categories of protected land and these are basically like internationally recognized categories of land management. So the first one is a national park. National parks are generally set aside for science research, education, recreation. Um, they are also set apart to uh, conserve habitats. A good example of a national park would be Kruger National Park in South Africa or Amboseli National Park in Kenya. Both of those were set up to protect these big savanna landscapes and the animals that go along with them, you know, cheetahs, lions, rhinos, giraffes. Um, so those would be examples of national park. One thing that has been controversial with national parks is that in many cases, or in a lot of cases, um, native peoples, indigenous peoples have been evicted from national parks. So they are displaced to somewhere else as the government is setting that land aside as a national park. And also know that national parks usually offer really good opportunity for tourism money. Next one you've got is a managed resource protected area. And one of these areas is set aside for sustained use of biological, mineral, and recreational resources. So these areas, they basically say, all right, the resources in this area can be used, but they have to be used in an area that is, or in a manner that is sustainable. So we've got a beautiful seashore here. This area would be managed for recreational resource of the beautiful view, probably people snorkeling, boating, whatever. Um, but it could be used also for hunting. It could be logging, whatever. It's sustained use um, of the resources in that area. Then you got a habitat or a species management area. Now, these areas are managed to maintain biological communities. And in doing so, there could be hunting promoted to keep a predator down. There could be hunting discouraged to save the animals. There could be logging encouraged or discouraged. These areas are set aside for protecting a specific habitat or species. Now, an example of this, two of them, there's Karelia, which is up in Russia. It's a big area of land that is protected. I think it's an Arctic habitat. And then right there, you got the Galapagos Islands. That whole area is protected to preserve the species and the habitat around the Galapagos. You've got wilderness areas, and these areas are pretty much off limits, untouchable. You don't develop them. You can have some recreational use on them but not really any development or anything else. A good example of this is the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, obviously up in Alaska. Um, it's a huge tract of land. It's like 37% of America's managed land. And at the moment, it is off use, though this is debatable because there's a lot of oil under Anwar and people obviously want to drill for the oil in Anwar. So having Alaska set aside or this section of Alaska set aside as a wilderness area puts it off limits for oil exploration, though there is always a lot of debate about whether we should start drilling for oil up in the wild, the wilderness refuge or not. You've got protected landscapes and seascapes. These are areas that are protected purely for their natural beauty. Um, they are allowed to be used in a non-destructive manner, so their natural resources can be used. Um, they can be used for tourism, they can be used for recreation. So examples of this would be protected islands or seashores where it's just recognized this is a beautiful place, it's good for humans, it's good for tourism, it's good for recreation, so we are going to take care of this area of land. And then you've got national monuments. National monument is going to be a site of special national or cultural interest. An example of that would be Mount Rushmore there. You've got the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Um, you have got the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. So every country around the world has got their own national monuments, and these are just areas that are recognized as being uh, significant for some reason or other. Now, let's go ahead and bring it home to America and wrap it up with this. In America, 25% of the land is publicly owned. Um, as a country, we have the largest percentage of land being publicly owned of any country in the world. Funny thing is, we don't have the most protected land, but percentage-wise, the government owns a lot of land. Um, only 10% of the government-owned land in America is in the Midwest and the East. Most of America's publicly owned land is in the West and up in Alaska. And if we talk about how Americans use land, here's kind of a breakdown. This is all of the land in America, public and private. Um, you've got 10% of America's land being completely unused. It could be desert, it could be tundra, 
You got nothing going on there except for maybe some hiking and recreation. 23% of America's land is used for timber production, 1% used for defense, 4% uh, used for urban, residential, or transportation purposes, 11% um, for recreation and wildlife lands, 20% for cropland, 6% for forest and grazing, and then 25% for grassland grazing. Now, I said that that was all American lands. I was wrong. That is just for America's publicly owned lands. And I believe there's two slides to wrap up for the day. So problem with Americans' land, uh, the way that our land use policies have been set up is they've been set up in such a way that there is a conservation ethic, which means that we want to take care of them and we want to preserve them. But they have not necessarily always been well protected. So most of America's lands, unless it is designated as a wilderness area, can be used for resource extraction. So that could be mining, that could be drilling for oil, that could be uh, cutting timber. So it's kind of this thing where with America's land, everybody wants a piece of the pie. You've got conservationists that want to take care of the land. You've got recreational people who want to use the land. And then you've got developers who want to develop the land and use the resources. So there's continually a debate around America's land and the protection of our land. So to kind of help out with that debate, the government has set up four major agencies for managing America's lands. And here's the agencies and what they are responsible for. You've got the BLM, which is the Bureau of Land Management. BLM is responsible for lands that include mining, timber harvesting, and recreation. So if you're mining, if you're logging, and if you're recreating, those lands are probably managed by the Bureau of Land Management. You've got the United States Forest Service, USFS. USFS lands are used for timber harvesting, grazing, and recreation. You've got NPS, the National Park Service. Their land is strictly for recreation and conservation. And then you've got the FWS, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Their land is used for conservation, hunting, and recreation. So I know that was a lot of like agencies and categories and stuff like that. Make sure that you go back and rewind and catch you know the six types of land around the world. Make sure that you know the American agencies. Make sure that you know um, at least a little bit about why there's conflict around land use and management and make sure you know those major principles the tragedy of commons externalities and maximum sustainable yield thanks for joining us on the lab 207 webcast my name is mr kite and we'll see you again